were you aware of this story as it was happening, or were you introduced to it through the script? How did this come about? I remember it, but not very well. And the reason I remember it was it was uh, taking place right during the tail end of the George Bush, uh, Michael Dukakis presidential campaign in in the fall of 1988. And I do remember that it's, it's uh, because I followed the campaign very closely, and I do remember uh, watching primetime news, and, and occasionally there'd be an article or a, a piece about some trapped whales. So I... It, it, it's sort of it's I kind of remember it, but I, I certainly didn't remember any of the details about it. Well, this feels like a very uh, like a passion uh, project. There's the, it feels like a lot of passion went into this film, and and I'm curious to know when you read the material, what about it made you say I have to make this movie? Here's what I fell in love with. I fell in love with the idea of a story about a group of people, uh, most of whom have different philosophies, uh, in many cases uh, competing agendas, ulterior motives, strange bedfellows, in other words, a group of strange bedfellows who uh, would normally not be caught you know, having a drink together, uh, who have to come together and, and figure out a way to solve an impossible task. Um, so, I mean, I, I, that, that really appealed to me. I, the picture I did right before Big Miracle was a romantic-themed film, He's just not that into you. And that was a film that had nine major characters in it. Mm -hmm. But in that film, th that was a different kind of film in the sense that there was a theme, and it, the theme was uh, explored in different stories. Uh, most of the stories did not overlap. In this case, this is a, a more of a, a true ensemble about a group of people trying to uh, accomplish something together. But what I loved is how different those characters were and, again, how uh, op opposed they were philosophically. Well, that's what amazes me uh, most about the film, I think, is because it started out as a small story and then it kind of grew in, uh, into, it kind of had international ramifications. Um, but you never, juggling all those characters, and uh, you never lose sight of the humanity and, and the plight of these whales. Was that the main challenge of the film for you? Oh, absolutely. The thing is, at the center of both the media circus that descended upon Barrow, but also at the center of all the efforts on the part of these characters are three characters, the three main characters, the three gray whales. And uh, as Drew Barrymore puts it wonderfully in a scene, she says well, the most heartbreaking thing about their plight is that they know they're in trouble. They know they're in trouble. Mm. And um, I'm certainly not a scientist. I'm certainly not uh, an expert on... Uh, animals, but you know, in, in doing research for the project, I, I certainly came to learn that whales are have as advanced an intellect as as any animals out there, and and so I love the idea that you know, the three creatures have uh, a real consciousness about the dilemma they face, and I think that's what makes. Uh, them so you know, that makes the trio so powerful. It's also a family. So the other part of it is is it's a it's a story about a trapped family, and um, so I think that you know even though there, there's all this all these other events swirling around them, and there are so many uh, layers to the picture. Not only is the story set against the backdrop of a again a presidential uh, campaign. In America, but it's also set against the backdrop of uh, you know, uh, there's a geopolitical backdrop. It's 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 the tail end of the Cold War, yeah. and so despite I don't want to say despite, but you know, even with all this sort of uh, swirling activity around them, the heart of the picture remains these three whales that you know are in this like rather gruesome dilemma. Well. Staying on that, well, talking about the, the the layers as you are of this piece, and and going on to kind of the process of putting it all together, did you find that there there was a, a a lot of a lot of shaping and rearranging going on in the editing room to have it all kind of fit seamlessly together? Oh, absolutely, and and um, again, because there were so many different attempts happening simultaneously, you know, part of the challenging. Part of the challenge in cutting the picture together was whose attempt you know should uh, get the focus and when, uh, whether it was the Dermot Mulroney character, you know, taking two of those immense 
helicopters, sky cranes, and dragging this hover barge across the Arctic sea ice, or whether it was the Inupiat people, led by the whale hunter Malik, uh, who came up with what seemed like an insane plan to carve a series of holes in the ice with no real hope that the whales would move from hole to hole. So in editing the picture, it was like what, you know, finding the right order for these things to happen. Uh, Let's put it this way. It was definitely something we made, uh, we discovered in the cutting of the Mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. Well, this is such a dramatic story uh, in and of itself. I I wouldn't think it it would need any kind of, uh, extra flourishes. <laughs> uh, would your film get necessarily dramatic license or anything? But uh, did you feel a kind of responsibility to the the real life counterparts as part of the story? Oh well, definitely. I mean, again, like some of the and some of the real life counterparts uh, were helpful in putting together the film. Um, I I felt a particular responsibility to the Inuit people who are, the, again, the native Alaskan people who occupy the what's called the north slope of the state, the northern end of the state. And, you know, I tried very hard in depicting them, not to patronize them or romanticize them, but to, uh, but to, but to you know, make, make you get to know them uh, as you would any other characters. So I, but I did feel a, a kind of a keen responsibility to them as a group. And um but I definitely felt like this would be this is a film that uh, as you said it, you don't need to embellish it too much. Uh it's all there. And one of the things you should know is that not only is it all there, there were about 150 reporters uh who descended well wow. uh, upon the town of Barrow in the fall of 1988. Again, as soon as Tom Brokaw Fell in love with that first, those first set of images, and, and agreed to put a, a piece on NBC Nightly News about the whales, the trapped whales. Literally within 24 hours, every news service in the country and and across the world sent people to Barrow. So there were about 150 people there, most of them armed with video cameras. And this is in the this is in the beta age, by the way. Um, <laughs> But so there's a mountain of footage uh, that these people took uh, of the rescue, and one of the things we did is we, we had access uh, to all of this footage, combed through it, and used a lot of it in the film. So when you're watching the film, when you see the whales, occasionally you're seeing the whales that we created. We cre- we built large animatronic whales. At other times, you're seeing whales that were created uh, through computer-generated imagery. Those are the shots underwater. But many times, particularly when you're looking at a television monitor, you'll see interspersed with the whales we created, the actual whales from footage taken in 1988. Mm. And it was our goal to to, to replicate the real whales as, as, as perfectly as we could. Absolutely, and you guys did a great great job on that. But there's also the character of, uh, and you touched upon it there, the location itself. Um, it, it, what was what was it like being in, in that environment and having that play a role in, in the film? Well, two things you should know. One is the story is set primarily in the town of Barrow, Alaska, which is about 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle, and it is the most northern town in our hemisphere, period. So that's where the story is set. We we certainly had a small unit shooting in Barrow, but most of our work was done in Anchorage. Uh doesn't mean it wasn't cold, but it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't as far north as Barrow itself. So we shot in Anchorage. We shot in the fall heading towards winter because we did want the cold. We wanted snow and uh and we got it <laughs> and it was cold <laughs> and uh, so among the many uh things that made this such a physically daunting picture for me was it was intensely cold and as we got in uh into the fall we you know in Alaska you you're you're losing daylight at a rate of about a minute and a half a day mm-hmm. so we had uh, short hours we again we had these large animatronic whales we had to build an ice field set. So the Arctic sea ice that's frozen was a set. 
a, a huge set, a football field size set, and in the middle of the set, um, we built an underground water tank in order to house the three animatronic whales. Now, occasionally the whales would break, and in order to fix them, we would have to send divers down into the tank into into very cold water <laughs> to do very complicated repairs on animatronic animals. Wow. So it was a it was complicated, and then add to that a, a large ensemble, uh, some of whom were actors who had never been in front of a camera before. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the 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 man who played the whale hunter Malik and the boy of Mao were were um, new to new to movies. Wow, new to movies cast cast in Alaska, and. Um, so it was a it was a pretty it was a logistically pretty complicated picture. <laughs> I bet it was. Uh, be- before I let you go, I-, I have to ask you about this because we just did a big series on cinematography, and it's something mm-hmm. that fascinates us on the show. And and it, with this one and a couple of your other films, you're you're working with one of the best, uh, John Bailey. What what is the what is the dynamic between the two of you? The conversations that go on when you're building the the look of a film. You know, it's funny, in this case, each of the films we've done, we've done several films together, but in this one we really wanted, we had a very strong idea, and it, it's simple, and let me explain it. We wanted to feel, we wanted the audience to feel like we were capturing the action as opposed to staging it for the camera. Now, that may seem like a subtle distinction, but we wanted to, as much as possible, shy away from things that felt overly choreographed and especially out on the ice itself we wanted to feel more like things were happening and we were able to grab it or capture it that's not to say we were veering into mockumentary land at all Mm -hmm. but but if anything i would say that we were thinking about uh literally like italian neorealism and and the way those those the films of say the Rossellini films after the Second World War were photographed, where you just got a sense that the camera was there to eavesdrop on the action as opposed to in other kinds of films where things are, again, staged so precisely for the lens or or, or, or where compositions feel overly manicured and and, and precious. So right. that, was our, that was our guiding principle. I mean, whether or not we achieved it, I, I'm, I'm, that's for someone else to say, but that was kind of how we went into it. 